welcome to the 2021 Night of Ideas here in Toronto. At Alliance Française Toronto, we are glad to host this beautiful event of the Night of Ideas. Before starting, I would like to acknowledge that we are located on traditional territories. These territories include the Wendat Nation, the Odinosonis Confederacy, the Anishinaabek Nation, the Mississauga of the New Credit First Nation, and the Métis Nation. Without further ado, please enjoy the following conversation. Good morning. Hello. Good afternoon. Yes. Good afternoon. Uh, I am Lucien Toro. Uh, and I am uh, Pierre Godard. Uh, who are you both? I am a choreographer and dancer, originally from the US, uh, but I've been living in France for over 10 years now. And I'm uh, also. Uh, choreographer, um, although I don't like labels that much, so I often prefer to be called whatever people want me to be called, uh, artist, I guess, if I accept that um, label. And uh, um, yeah, together we uh, co-direct a contemporary dance company um, called uh, Le Principe d'Incertitude was based in Paris, but has also a long history of uh, working between the US and, and France. Uh, my name is Doug Eco. I'm an assistant professor in drama and performance studies at the University of Toronto, where I also serve as the assistant director of a lab we have for performance and emerging technologies. Uh, so to get started, I want uh, for you to continue to introduce a bit your company and the work you've been doing over this past decade uh, and just kind of situate your company for us a little bit uh, before we get into more of our uh, thematic conversation. Uh, so yeah, the company uh, is called Le Principe d'Incertitude and it's kind of, um, it's kind of a bit of a, a program for the work. Uh, it's, it's a reference to the uncertainty principle um, from uh, quantum physics, but also uh, uh, a play on the idea that it's a bit of an oxymoron, like um, that you need to um, play with doubt to get access to any sort of um, truth and make room uh, for uncertainty if you are to have any sort of um, uh, belief or certainty about anything. So it's not a program for uh, general uh, relativism and, and, and not caring about anything. It's quite the opposite, uh, insisting and in trying to understand. Uh, our work has been happening, I would say, a lot at the frontier of uh, movement-based, often called uh, dance uh, performance, and, and text-based, uh, often called uh, theater uh, uh, performance. Uh, although we're in the, uh, identified as dance makers, uh, it's true that there's a lot of um, um, coming also from our own background and history. Liz is uh, coming from dance and I come more for, from theater, actually from mathematics and from scientific training, both are, but um, but I started uh, when I left finance to work in theater. So um, I'm very still interested in working with text and uh, a lot of the work that we've been doing has been uh, trying to uh, um, explore contact points between uh, text and movement and performance. Your work has spoken to this from many different directions, I think, but I want to first to sort of establish us in the environment of the pandemic, where this has become uh, such a strange and constantly with us concern. So as artists of the body, uh, as artists of uh, the stage, where we're used to gathering many bodies together for, for what it is we do, I want to ask you what this year of isolation has taught you about uh, distance to come at the push theme from the reverse. It's, it's, uh, it's taught me um, that uh, I don't like it, <laughs> that it's, that it's not, it's, uh, it doesn't work. It, it's not, it's not something that um, for me personally, I think, I think something that we share, but very much for me personally, I, I, haven't been able to um, 
do the okay let's make do and let's 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 shift to um uh more video and image work um th this is this is proximity and 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 the body and and bodies and and my body in relationship to other bodies that is that is everything for me that is the work um that is what i've committed my life to and commit on a daily basis is it's not an easy thing actually to commit to and in terms of a, a job, especially these days, especially in this past year. Um, so yeah, I would say that it's, I haven't, I haven't been taught very much <laughs> in, in yeah. that sense, other than it's, it's just, um, it, it, it doesn't work. It's, 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 um, I mean, of course there's other, there's other beautiful things that have come out of this experience, um, of, of being distant, uh, namely the, the situation that we're in right now. I mean, being able to connect to you and to people that will watch this and, and different formats of actually connecting and being in conversation is has been a huge gift. Um, but from the standpoint of the body and being an artist working um, with the body distance uh, gives me nothing uh, um, other than reaffirming uh, the need uh, for this medium of, of, of physical uh, work and performance and live performance, it's, it's just reaffirmed more and more the, the, the vitality that, that, that uh, holds for, for, for us as a, as, a, as a species, as a culture, as a, as a, as a world. Um, yeah. Well, this provides a really natural segue to one of your first works, Watch It, which is like quite precisely uh, about these themes of uh, nearness and distance, uh, about uh, a certain kind of intensification of an audience, but also a, a radical distanciation of, a, of the performer. Um, so I wonder if you could introduce this piece to us. It was a piece we we made in uh, in Midtown uh, Manhattan uh, at the Museum of Arts and Design uh, in 2012. Mm -hmm. They invited us to come and make something in the museum, and we did tours of the museum. And it just there was there was a there was one theater in the space, but the stage was about um, felt like it was like a meter deep. Um, and so it was there, you could either, you know, give a speech or do some, you know, Nijinsky, um, so that was, and then the other, there were, there was sort of atelier spaces, but really nothing was making much sense. And um, so we really say, okay, no, no, thank you. Um, thank you, but no, thank you. And then we, uh, on our way out, I remember just seeing a security guard kind of open this giant uh, wall in the lobby. Uh, and I asked the, the curator, I said, you know, what's what's behind this strange sort of wall this the security guard just opened up? He said, oh, it's just the loading dock. And he said, we can, you can check it out if you want. And so we went in there to the loading dock and then um, you see the big red button to open the, the sort of um, garage door. 
And I said, oh, can I, can I hit this? And I hit it and, and up goes the door. And then we're actually right uh, on the sidewalk of uh, 58th Street between um, Broadway and 8th Avenue. Um, so just this little stretch of, of, of street that's a one way um, in, 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 in Midtown. Um, and, you know, it goes up and it's just, you know, a beautiful, it's a beautiful show immediately. You know, there's just this, older older woman kind of just slowly walking by with her with a cane and you see you know just a couple taxis pass by maybe a, a, um, a delivery uh on a bicycle and it was just it was a, it was just a beautiful show already and i was so it was like okay uh, sold let's let well, this is this is the show um done um and of course there was a lot more, a lot more work to be done but it was quite um quite powerful just to to feel that the the, the street was just there when you wouldn't have mm -hmm. expected it and how how this you know this older woman passing through uh our field of vision she just kind of looked at us uh and then just looked away and it was immediately this feeling of like, oh, we were infringing on her. She, she was, we were infringing on her uh, personal space. Um, so anyway, uh, fast forward through the, through the creation process, but that was the inception of it. And um, eventually it, um, we, yeah, we installed um, the audience in, in the loading dock, um, which was an interesting proposition also because it was it was late November in New York City it was post hurricane Sandy I mean the whole thing was 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 quite uh, gymnastic uh, to try to organize we had installed like a heater we gave people hot cider blankets I mean it was a whole a whole kind of a fun adventure to try to um, orchestrate but we installed the audience in the loading dock um, and we had uh, performers uh, walking the sort of what like, you know, kind of a digital, uh, what a digital um, eight, uh, when you see like a digital clock, that sort of eight figure um, of the two, like from a bird's eye view, if you imagine a 58th and 59th street, and we had um, the performers walk and spell from a bird's eye view, spell the word choreography from that uh, perspective on the two blocks, city blocks. Um, which meant that only they would only cross through the middle if they were writing uh, by walking the pattern of an H, let's say, if you imagine the, the letter H or the letter R. Um, so they were only passing the field of vision of the audience uh, every once in a while in this 45 minute uh, time frame. Um, and what happened was that we thought it was quite obvious that there were these same performers that were gonna cross the audience's uh, field of vision um, I don't know how many times I've forgotten how many times they cross, depending on how they choose to make the pattern. They all they all have their own uh, place to start and they have their own way to actually make that happen. Um, that was not prescribed. The only instruction they had was they had to do it in forty five minutes and mm. not get you know um, either to be careful about traffic and not. I think it was get forty. Hit. Forty minutes. Yeah. Oh, you're right. It was forty minutes. So they they didn't have a lot of time to 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 do it, and they also oh so it was the the most important thing was that no one would get hurt. Um, terms of traffic and um, uh, traffic lights. So, um, but nonetheless, they could, they could cross on either side of the street. They didn't have, they could be on the, the near side of the far side of the street. Um, but I think we calculated at one point how many times they would each cross the, each individually cross the path of field division of the audience. And it was, it was quite a high number, um, but yet the audience uh, didn't notice them. Uh, the majority of the audience, even people who had, you know, friends who were in the performance, whose friends came to see and sat in the audience, they would afterwards say, okay, well, where, what did you do actually in the show? Were you, you know, where were you? What, what actually happened? So people who, you know, you, you someone you know very well is, has been crossing your path. Yeah, the, the performance is experimenting with a certain kind of invisibility of exactly. the performer, even though they are before our vision. And we have what feels like a theatrical arrangement uh, and you are looking at the performers, yet there is some, you, you have uh, shed a lot of the devices of the stage that actually help train the eye. Exactly. Because yeah. I think the, one of the interests was, I mean, there was obviously a sort of a Cajun in heritage of like, just like, okay, like, or Duchampion, like ready made, like sort of heritage of, okay, you open like a window, a back door to the street and there's already or, a full show happening. That or even the situationists, the, the street is already a theater. Yeah. yeah. So there's already, there's already a piece happening that's like actually 
more interesting than most of the shows that we see if we start to look at it as such. Uh, and obviously that's the same idea with Cage listening at like traffic or uh, things like that. But uh, beyond, because there was clearly a playful reference to that in that piece, but it was also a drive to a challenge. Uh, soon, uh, and I think early on in our work, there was uh, something that remained uh, challenging the hierarchies of uh, perception, like what's the spectacular, what's valuable, what's like the virtuosity. Actually performing the walking score that was invisible to the audience uh, was a bit involved. I, I performed it and you needed to keep track like very, uh, th there was quite some work to achieve it in the right time without hurting yourself and doing the uh, score, but that was invisible or under the threshold of conscious perception. I, maybe it's not like exactly invisible, but it's it's not per consciously fully perceived. Whereas like, and you didn't talk about uh, Reed uh, uh, performing also an improv uh, dance um, uh, that was like happening three floors above the audience, yeah. but reflected in the building across. And it looked like actually Reed, uh, Reed Baltimore was performing in the building across, so there was an, an illusion. Because of those uh, New York City skyscraper yeah. Of course, the, the, the dance, yeah. the set dance seemed to be what he was doing, but what he was doing was uh, uh, fully improv. I mean, there was a score and, a, and there was a connection to- A musician the, in the lobby. Uh, yeah, the, 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 the music that uh, Ada was performing. But uh, what was set and worked and rehearsed was invisible and what was improvised. And I guess also all kinds of things happening in the street looked choreographed because of course there's all kinds of events that are like happening and someone stops and start to talk. It really looks like set, like, is it so perfect and so funny that you're like, okay, like this, like they hired someone to come and pretend they're walking the street. And I don't know, of course we didn't, but all kinds of events happening look choreographed and what is choreographed uh, doesn't look su as such. It's like maybe the least spectacular part that's actually the most worked on. So it was also something that we're trying to get at uh, perceptively or create an experience in which like, you don't know what's really the value, quote unquote, of the work, the effort of the work, the hierarchy of what's important and what's not important. Maybe it's not what you think is. introduce for Claude Shannon and then we can uh, ask both of you about uh, what it's like to do that kind of not quite visible labor for an audience. I mean I can say a word about Folklore Tenon and its inception. Uh, we had made a piece called Relative Collider in which um, as I mentioned before we're interested in contact points between text and movement and uh, in Relative Collider we're uh, using the dance um, structure to create and generate in real time um, a text um, that I was uh, performing and I was changing it each night. And I'm not gonna go into the details of that, but after that uh, piece, we're interested in reversing the process and, and injecting the variability in the movement the way it had been experienced in that piece uh, in the text. And so we use textual uh, structure to generate movement in the form of, uh, I mean, I was starting a PhD in natural language processing and I was really interested in, um, in those, those, those like syntactic uh, uh, models. So, and so we, we use uh, 
dependency structure that was extracted automatically by it was like the first like neural net uh, models that were able to do that with some errors of course and so we use that structure as a sort of uh, generator for movement and we um, created a, a score um, that's um, instantiated through a random draw and it can lead to uh, a bit less than 30 billion different choreographic sequences that the dancers start to learn an hour and a half before the audience uh, comes in. And then the uh, performance is somewhat the end of the learning into uh, um, a somewhat like prescribed compositionally uh, way to develop the material that has just been uh, acquired and learned. But it also becomes a way of, uh, you know, the dance will becomes presented to us as it seems random, but in the traditional sense it isn't. There is a set of underlying, much more algorithmic digital logics binding these actions together. It's not a dice roll between each movement. I don't know, uh, it's the gram uh, uh, English grammar. I mean, the, gra right. that's the setup, uh, right. actually how the language we're using right now, how that organizes itself um, to communicate and share that communication is, is exactly yeah. the same logic that we, right. Yeah. And there was, let, let me add that, that there was, uh, it was also the result of a, a thought process that was uh, not particularly, it, it, um, we're not trying to make things hard, just uh, to make them hard for the dancers as like somewhat like sadist or, because um, it's kind of the performer's nightmare, like you're going to walk on stage with a piece that you don't know the choreography. Don't know the choreography. <laughs> but it was not, of course, why we came there. It, it, it was a, a thought process where we wanted variability in, in the dance. And so we had the question of the interface for that, like how, and we didn't want like random improv. So there was a need for variability and that can be achieved in real time uh, if you provide for interface in the form of say sound or uh, visual cues. But then in my experience, and I uh, ex experienced that in other works, uh, the interface can start to become overwhelming and kind of the center of attention, which then like highlights the fact that it's a sort of algorithmic process that's implemented by bodies on stage. And we're not interested in, in doing that. So uh, we came, I think, quite naturally to the conclusion that if you want to have variability, but also emancipation and autonomy from the performers, then the one thing that you can do and that we did is to learn, acquire something, but different every day. So you have kind of the capacity to have some autonomy with the material and you still have the variability like from one performance uh, to another. So this, this um, came about not yeah, uh, out of the blue, but really out of a concern to, to to have variability and unlike text generated with an interface that's quite natural and not obstru obstructive, obstrusive, mm -hmm. uh, with movement, it's it's harder. If you provide an interface, it becomes very much about the interface because you need to make it bigger if you move in space and all this. So um, um, yeah, the learning also uh, very much came from the desire to give a score that would be variable, but also not, uh, uh, a prescription from some sort of machine that you would have to just like enact as a robot. I want to uh, invite you now to introduce maps for us, which, uh, you know, in this spirit of being a little contrarian and also a little uh, literal, you have brought text into dance and onto the stage in, uh, yeah, the most literal but least obvious way. Um, and I wonder if you could explain a bit uh, what this performance was and how it came about. Well, I think I, I think um, at the origin of maps, with the idea 
that after reading an article in Nature and uh, the work from a, a, a researcher called uh, Alex Uth, or Uth, I don't know how you pronounce it, uh, who was at Berkeley. Um, at the time, uh, and with collaborators, they had worked on, on, on uh, uh, identifying semantic maps uh, in the cortex. So they had like people uh, hear or read, I think, hear stories, and they were doing fMRI or other imagery. And uh, they discovered that there was like some sort of a stability, uh, at least in the English language, across uh, individuals about where like the brain was firing uh, um, when people would hear certain words and all this and started to construct like a pretty beautiful and stunning at the time, like um, a digital like uh, website where you could actually explore uh, those semantic maps. And uh, yeah, it, it struck us that it was a very spatial way to represent language and thinking of like language being actually a physical deployment in space in our brain suddenly gave a, a bit of a sort of, as you said, like straightforward, but not so straightforward uh, way to think of like connecting movement and text uh, as two medium, which is something that we're always somewhat um, um, turning around um, and, and having a drive to investigate. And, and so um, uh, uh, we sort of think like, oh, what if like language is, is deployed uh, uh, in, in, in the space of the states, like through uh, semantic uh, uh, categories, and then movement obviously is going to be also deployed in space on stage. And what if like that happens in the same like referential, then we could connect uh, textual events to uh, movement events and vice versa. And then it developed into a codification of a, a, a matrix where zones were corresponding to semantic categories and um, dancers would make uh, choices according to uh, word being generated um, uh, and, 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 and they would like develop like movement conversation. I mean, the, the piece ended up being very much like a, a grammar for a language, except that this is language of movement, where there's like a sort of a, a articulatory phonetic like level with like a time and space grammar. And then there's like a syntactic level, uh, there's sorry, a lexical level with like lexical of movement. And then there's a syntactic level with like operations of like merging or distorting or extending or, and then there's a semantic level. So, and, and gradually as the piece was getting developed, we gradually removed everything that was uh, set so uh, when we premiered the piece, it was just this grammar. I mean, there was like some uh, st structural elements that were present, but the actual movement uh, 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 and, and score was not written. It was, and at the same time, it was not a really improvised piece. It was, uh, the metaphor that I use is, is that it's a bit like a, the conversation that we're having right now. Uh, we don't feel like it's improvised because it's structured by our command, which in my case is limited to the English language and uh, also the drive to communicate, right? Like, so there's something that doesn't make us feel like we're just improvising in the way we would talk about improvisation in dance, but there's a sort of structural element and drive and orientation that kind of makes it feel, uh, and actually a lot of people see maps and think it's set, uh, Choreography. They don't think it's uh, it's uh, fully unwritten. I, well, in the, in the movement itself, uh, I'm so curious uh, how you settled on the kind of vocabulary it has, because uh, unlike uh, Claude Shannon, it, it's a really kind of organic, like fun feeling movement. Like it looks really cool. And this is something, you know, what you described here. Uh, we might think of the kind of more conceptual dance of the 70s of listening to Childs or something, but what we see in front of us has this uh, joy in, um, and uh, swagger in the movement. That's not what we usually think of when we're thinking of these complicated grammatical structures in the stage. And so uh, how did you arrive at that flavor? Um, there's a, there's, a structure. There's a there's a time structure and a and a, um, uh, a déplacement. What is it? Déplacement. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, uh, um, 
uh, a, space, a, a, a spa spatial pattern um, sort of uh, rule or sort of set up in this sort of kind of grammatical way of rules um, that was based on, it was a sort of a side uh, uh, interest that I was having a small obsession at the moment with this thing um, called uh, 2C motion, which was this, uh, this optical illusion it was like some mathematician in the 13th century uh, named Tusi who, uh, if you have these points uh, on sort of spokes, wheel spokes, let's say, and they they just travel on a diagonal, um, and then uh, each if each point on the spoke is just in canon, like each one starts off and it's slightly uh, uh, delayed from the other from the next, it creates illusion that these points on the on the moving each one moving on a line creates a circle. So it makes this illusion that uh, it's actually what the dancers are doing in the audience entrance uh, for the show. It's actually a way for the, for the six dancers to be staying warm and being in connection and, and, and being in movement and being in the, the uh, rhythm of the, uh, of the dance just by walking um, while the audience is coming into the space. Um, but most people think we're just walking in a circle, but we're just, if you rewatch it with that in mind, you'll see that each dancer is just walking on his own diagonal. Mm -hmm. um, so that said, we 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 figured out we there's a couple ways to uh, accomplish that um, sort of illusion, um, just from thinking working early on in the research of the of the piece. And one way to do that is to um, to structure and have uh, just cut each beat. If we are working with a metronome, you cut each beat in half and then in thirds, so that you are in sort of a pen a pendular like a like pendulum uh, movement where you're you're slowest at the two endpoints and fastest in the middle as you as you get. So you're almost stopping at each end, just like a pendulum. So what it, the movement structure, a uh, rhythm, rhythmic structure, excuse me, of the of maps is uh, a full beat and then uh, a half beat, two half beats and then uh, a triplet. So it's like one, one, two, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, one, which creates this uh, pendulum. What, what makes for Cluchanan and maps like look so different in the feeling? It's glossary. just the fact that the glossary, the lexical level, is in one case like kind of abstract and based on, it's not abstract at all, it's based on anatomical plane and actually was in Foucault and it was intended to be actually something that everybody can do, that it doesn't have a virtuosity and doesn't have like, can be objective, like can be objective and not like subjective expression of horizontal movement. plane, we all have the same but, like, and, sagittal plane. And, and then maybe you can elaborate yeah. on the weight shift and yeah. and the dancers like contributing movement but it's 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 actually um it's actually totally possible to make maps that would be essentially fundamentally the same piece but just changing the lexical level as if you were changing from german to russian like mm -hmm. you have a set of like 100 words and if those words are in german or in russian then the whole feeling of what you say with those words will be different however maybe you'll say exactly the same thing mm -hmm. just a translation yeah. so my my point is that like sometimes it's also yet another interesting to me way to look at the hierarchy of perception and what's spectacular and what's actually what we see because people can have the perception that Fukuoka channel and maps are very different piece and they are, but not for the reason that's the most explicit and obvious, which is like in, 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 in one case, we elected a lexicon that uh, was uh, more organic. So sort of the base of that was that was a questioning around uh, the definition of movement being uh, a transfer of weight. You know, even if I, if I just lift my hand here, I, I, I made so there's shift in my weight to actually allow what movement, what generates movement, allows movement to happen is that uh, distribution of weight that shifts. So it was this question of what happens if, if I have a certain amount of time to shift from one foot to another, and then what happens if I have half that time to shift from one foot to another? Um, and what happens if I have a third of the time to shift from one foot to another? So that was part of this idea of saying, okay, what, what, what what happens? What happens to, in my body versus someone like Luca Basro, who's uh, you know much is a, a dancer in the piece who's you know much much taller than me, for example. What what is what's what happens for him um, in that in that in that space and in that time? Um, so it was 
there was a sort of dissection and, and a questioning in terms of that in that kind of micro level uh, of questioning movement. Um, so what we ended up doing was creating this uh, a glossary where the dancers, each of the six dancers contributed to a glossary where they uh, created a movement for each of the um, several movements for each of these categories of a weight shift that can happen between one foot to another foot in a full count and a movement that would need uh, one count to do two shifts of movement uh, and another one that was uh, three shifts of weight in one count. Um, so some of them automatically would come when you had to, each one had to um, have a name. So each dancer would you know, have come up with a series of them and they would have to name them and explain them and teach them to uh, the other five dancers. And then they would be the sort of gatekeeper of that one. So even when now when we tour the piece and we rehearse it, that's the person who kind of jumps out and kind of is looking at and seeing what's happening and giving feedback to try to refine that consensus. Because also the, the dancer who's making that is, is also uh, contributing that movement to the glossary, but then is also in relationship to, which is very much part of what happens in a piece like Focal Chen and, or Relative Clutter, it's that we really work on, a, on consensus, that movement is really made in consensus. It's not, certainly not me and certainly not Pierre going, okay, well, no, could you actually, could your arm be a little bit lower or higher? And that was the thing of for Clutchen and of like, okay, I don't really, I'm not really interested in saying, oh no, I like this better uh, than this, but more just saying, okay, what, where's my, where's my, what is my morphology and my anatomy and where is the horizon line and how can I, how can I organize myself? And so that's that. It's not, we don't have to say, okay, uh, no, you're mm, a little bit, you know, we can do that and say, oh, but, you know, I'm starting to like get me a little tired. So my arm drops, that's some, can something we can check in on, but there's no aesthetic uh, judgment that way. So I think there was also something quite nice about this glossary of saying, okay, I'm going to propose, um, for example, there's uh, uh, one, Luca, for example, has a, has a noir uh, that's called a chicken. And so it's like, okay, he, he's going to, this is like, this is this chicken movement that he came up with the name. He came up with the movement that's taking up one full count for one uh, transfer of weight. And then he's seeing uh, that on the other bodies and going, okay, wait, no, actually, you know, I think, wait, maybe it's more, you know, okay, uh, what's happening in my body? What's what? And then that conversation that starts to happen to establish this group consensus where, again, it's this place of like, okay, chicken is belonging to Luca, but Luca also needs us uh, to make it with him. And then we all share it and how that, glossary when we first made it and it's it's it was sort of stated in the kind of law of the piece of the glossary is a living um document where you can always i think even we just did it in Vesti right but in march right before everything shut down we did it um here in paris and we added uh, a couple uh, what we called species to the glossary. We added a couple. I said, oh, this would be, you know, why don't we, you know, and so it's, it can be, and we've actually taken some away. Um, so it's a living, breathing thing inside the work mm. that keeps us all in connection and conversation um, in terms of how our bodies are making the work in real time. And I think also in terms of when I talk about this audience entrance of us walking in the 2C motion, we also play this game where we walk like one of the dancers. Everyone's going to walk like Maya. We're all just going to try to try to be in Maya's body. And it's not something the audience, you know, it's not something that is evident to anyone from the outside, but it's something, yeah, that, that sets, sets us up to, to, to start the work and to really appreciate. It. And, and cause it's, it's also when you're the person that everyone's walking like it's, so it's pretty uncomfortable <laughs> for a moment because you're thinking it's like, oh, people are sort of like mimicking me or, they're, or you kind of see yourself projected times five. Um, and of course, everyone's pretty talented movers. So they're quite good at doing that in the drop of a hat. And you really see it. Um, you can be like, oh my gosh, wow, Jackie really looks like Mathieu, you know, or um, <laughs> it's quite, it's quite, uh, it's quite, yeah, it can be challenging in that sort of, in the same way of Fork Luchena with the tuning and really having to, to really be together and depend on each other. But I think when you talk about, it's an interesting to use the word swagger. I, I like that. Um, I've never, I never thought about it that way or, but, but it's true that you, you, we can, you can kind of, um, because of the, the, the rhythm of it and, and the, and the pace of it and the fact that there's these sort of duets and trios and, mm -hmm. and sextets that kind of are these conversations that are also randomly draw, like we all just pick a number before the show that tells us what, or a letter actually, that tells us what order we're going to go in. So we don't know until the moment happens that I'm going to be in a duet, say with um, Cynthia 
and then I'm in a trio with uh, Maya and Jackie. You know, it's it's a it's a it's a randomly um, the configurations of these conversations are generated just before we don't find out until we're actually on stage who gets what, who got what. Um, but yeah, I think it creates this this joy of 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 finding yourself suddenly someone's you know to to use a metaphor someone's like suddenly telling you about that summer camp they went to when they were 12 and that story about and you just suddenly feel like oh wow yeah I'm we're now that's something I'm learning about this person in real time but with the audience and we're all kind of doing it together it's not a story that's that's um that's textual and said, but it's it's originating from this, you know, the semantic map and these randomly generated words, which we didn't bring up as part of the piece where there's something that starts these conversation is a randomly generated word that we just have a word sort of spinner um, and then it stops when we ask it to stop. And then everyone organizes themselves on the semantic map according to how they, which category, semantic category, they feel that word associates for them. So that's what starts the conversation each time and so it can be quite yeah it's quite sometimes it can be dark because you can get a word that's uh, can be quite heavy um mm -hmm. it happened actually in bastille um so and sometimes you can get words that are quite funny i mean there's there's all kinds of things we don't know what's going to happen and how we treat it and how we deal with it and, and how those we words are extracted from books that the uh, dancers submitted so that i treated and mm -hmm. processed so that's also words that are already somehow in their brains because they've been like uh uh, feeling strongly about those books that they shared mm. and that I then like extracted yeah. this like uh, uh, large uh, vocabulary mm. for the generation. <laughs> uh, okay, so we should start to wrap up. Um, uh, and so I want to bring us back to our, our theme of uh, being close, close or near. Uh, and uh, particularly in this work you have that as you've kept emphasizing uh, is both incredibly dependent on being actually uh, close and alive with an audience and really trying to draw our attention to how unique those live performance experiences are, yet also at articulating these certain kinds of distances of certain ways that we can't access each other and are always uh, at a remove from the other. Uh, and so to ask you in this work, uh, what being proche means. Yeah, I, th I think, I mean, we touched that for me, um, whether the, there's actual physical proximity or not. And as I mentioned, uh, it's something that, that, that we're experimenting in a, in a new way uh, right now in the, in the past months, but uh, I think yeah, being proche uh, to me is a lot about um, veracity and attention and suspending uh, uh, expectations and uh, uh, very much embracing the principe d'incertitude uh, program of the company, which is like, uh, what do what do I see? Uh, do I see what I think I, I see? Can I make room for something else? Can I just like be in perpetual um, uh, movement with my perception and my connection um, uh, with uh, someone else? Like whether I stand in the audience and I'm watching the performance or I'm on stage performing with uh, others, how can I keep this uh, openness that actually, even if I'm not in direct proximity, will make me close, proche, in the sense that I'm able to receive and I'm able to emit uh, uh, information, sensation. Um, um, I think it's, it's quite, for me, fundamental in the work that we've been developing and then in the work that's ahead of us. And Liz, what is uh, being proche for you? Um, I think in the in the past almost year now we all are and you were even speaking about this earlier Doug, about your teaching is it in this format in this context of of, of being together that we've been uh, engaging in in the past almost year it's very clear to everybody um uh, what doesn't work and what's missing? What is what is that? We try to put words on it and say, oh yeah, I I, I can't quite you know connect or feel there, there's something that's there's a very large um 
that there's something large that's missing that we we try to put words on to try to understand and try to replace in other ways or or or, or make peace with. Um, and I think that um, being in touch with that in whatever way we have been in touch with it, to me, that hopefully <laughs> when we have it back, whatever that thing is of, of, of actually, again, being able to be together physically, it'll be quite uh, clear what that thing is that's missing. And, and um, that thing, we, we, yeah, we can, we can understand, we can grasp and, and, and try to put words on it, but really um, for me and to, 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 to just for me on a personal level, what, what that is, the words I can put on it is um, to, to be able to be posh uh, is actually able to be uh, with myself. In fact, to be able to, to be with others to actually see. And I think that's, that's what is the endless um, uh, question and the thing I can never, I can never fully uh, um, understand in the work that we're doing and doing performance work in general is, is how being able to see the other and how to being able to actually interact with the other in this, in a context around performance and being in, in that kind of space uh, allows us to see ourselves uh, and learn more about ourselves and uh, in that unknown place, both as the performer and as the audience and, and the unknown. Um, and, and to me, so yeah, to, 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 for me, I would say that posh, to be able to be posh is really to be able to be back uh, uh, with myself to um, feel like I'm doing my, my job uh, as best as I can when I'm actually allowing that to be visible to a spectator. Um, and not show a spectator that I know who I am and I know what I'm doing and I'm going to show you and tell you something about the world. But actually, what I need you to do is allow me to see your world and then we can start to create something together in that actual moment. Um, and that's, yeah, for me, that's what's been missing um, uh, these past months. Um, so that's what push, I would say, uh, is for me.